All right, we are on air. Hello and welcome everyone to the third and last of a three-part series on sex offender registration laws hosted by the NYU Review of Law and Social Change. Thanks to everybody who's joining us in real time or in the future if you're watching this on the website. Uh, my name is Sandy Mason. I'm a former public defender and currently a Furman Fellow at NYU School of Law. I'm very happy to be moderating today's panel. The first two panels in this series looked at the steep cost of registration and its limited efficacy in reducing rates of sexual offending. Today's panel looks ahead. We'll be discussing priorities and strategies for reform, and I'm thrilled to introduce four people who have done incredible work in this field. Brandon Buskey is a staff attorney with the American Civil Liberties Union's Criminal Law Reform Project. He's lead counsel on Doe v. Miami-Dade County, a challenge to Miami-Dade's residency restrictions, which have left hundreds of former sexual offenders homeless or transient. Brandon's other work involves impact litigation and policy advocacy to combat prosecutorial misconduct, inadequate indigent defense systems, racial disparities in criminal justice practices, and the excessive sentencing of youth. In past, Brandon has worked for the Civil Rights Bureau of the New York State Attorney General's Office and the Equal Justice Initiative in Montgomery, Alabama. Marsha Levick is the co-founder, deputy director, and chief counsel of Juvenile Law Center, America's oldest public interest law firm for children. Since 1975, Marsha has been an advocate for children's and women's rights and is a nationally recognized leader in juvenile law. She's co-authored many briefs before the U.S. Supreme Court as well as other federal and state courts. She spearheaded the Juvenile Law Center's work in the Luzerne County, Pennsylvania Kids for Cash judges scandal, and she argued the recent successful challenge to Pennsylvania's juvenile sex offender registration statute before the Pennsylvania Supreme Court. Wayne Logan, Gary and Salen Padgett Professor of Law at Florida State University, is one of the nation's leading legal authorities on sex offender registration and community notification laws. His work has appeared in the nation's leading law journals, and he is the author of the foremost scholarly monograph on Megan's Laws, Knowledge as Power, Criminal Registration and Community Notification Laws in America, recently cited by the Supreme Court. Professor Logan is an elected member of the American Law Institute and past chair of the Criminal Justice Section of the Association of American Law Schools. And finally, we have David Singleton, who is an attorney, an assistant professor at NKU Salmon P. Chase College of Law, and executive director of the Ohio Justice and Policy Center, a public interest law office that aims to reform Ohio's justice system. OJPC has filed numerous lawsuits and amicus briefs challenging sex offender res residency restrictions with notable success. David has also published scholarship on the subject of sex offender registration and notification laws and residency restrictions. And in past, he practiced as a public defender with the Neighborhood Defender Service of Harlem and the Public Defender Service for the District of Columbia. All right, and to give you just a sense of how this panel will proceed, we're going to begin with short presentations from the panelists about the work that they've most recently been involved in. Then we'll have a moderated discussion, and there will be time for audience questions at the end. So please do email us your questions during the panel. We'll begin with Marsha Levick and juvenile registration. Marsha, can you just bring us up to date on the juvenile uh, challenge that you led? Yes, thank you, Sandra, and uh, thanks to all of those who are joining us, and it's a pleasure to be a part of this panel this afternoon. Uh, we had uh, in Pennsylvania up until actually December of 2014 a juvenile sex offender registration law that provided for mandatory lifetime registration for juveniles who had been adjudicated of tier three offenses. This was legislation that was passed by our legislature in 2011. It was designed to bring Pennsylvania into conformity with the federal Adam Walsh Act, which of course in order to allow states to receive a certain percentage of federal dollars required that states uh, bring their juvenile sex offender registration laws uh, up to the levels that the federal Adam Walsh Act required. Uh, once the statute was passed, we very quickly sprung into action and put together a coordinated litigation strategy, working with colleagues in the Philadelphia Defender's Office and other defender offices around the state. 
we brought four different lawsuits challenging sex offender registration in four different juvenile trial courts across Pennsylvania. We had a strategy which, which was intended to uh, honestly see what results we got at the trial court level with an expectation that one or more of these cases would eventually make their way to the Pennsylvania Supreme Court. We had somewhat of a kitchen sink approach to our challenges. We brought an array of challenges to the statute on constitutional grounds, including substantive and procedural due process uh, related to an irrebuttable presumption, related to uh, ex post facto considerations. We brought Eighth Amendment challenges arguing that the uh, 21st century version of juvenile sex offender registration here was much more punitive than the kind of registration schemes that the United States Supreme Court had previously examined and found to be essentially collateral consequences that were more akin to a kind of civil regulatory scheme. The uh, framework in Pennsylvania, what our legislation required, was that, uh, as most of these very uh, draconian schemes now do, required that juveniles show up every 90 days, provide an array of personal identifying information, that they do that uh, essentially year in and year out. It required an enormous amount of updating of personal information, all of which had to be updated within three days of any changes. And it also required, should, stu should any of these juveniles at any point in their time on the registry violate those registration requirements in person, other reporting requirements, change of personal information, that they were subject to mandatory terms of incarceration anywhere from three to seven years. The legislation had the possibility that juveniles could petition to come off the registry after 25 years. Uh, they could not have any intervening charges uh, higher than a second degree misdemeanor, uh, which included actually their failure to register or to complete other requirements under the statute. So it was essentially uh, a, it was an opportunity to get off the registry with an unlikely outcome in terms of success because these kids would never be able to meet any of the requirements to do that. We, as I said, we threw a series of constitutional challenges out there we actually received favorable rulings from three of the courts in which we filed these challenges, all of them determining that the regulatory scheme that the legislature had set up violated uh, the juveniles' rights. And mostly the courts focused on the due process challenges, finding that the statute had set up an irrebuttable presumption, meaning that by finding that these kids were adjudicated delinquent of one of the predicate offenses, that the legislature made an assumption from that that these juveniles were necessarily dangerous and likely to reoffend. We brought these challenges ultimately to the Pennsylvania Supreme Court once those rulings came down. Pennsylvania Supreme Court agreed, found this to be an irrebuttable presumption. And uh, two points that I would note here, uh, I think that the research that we relied upon was critically important to our challenge, including an affidavit from Professor Logan uh, relating to the degree to which uh, web information uh, is incredibly porous and whether or not one is on a private registry, there are innumerable ways in which this information leaks out. We also were able to introduce evidence uh, in the trial courts that was stipulated to that underscored the degree to which juvenile sex offending is different in terms of kind and motivation uh, from adult sex offenders. It is often uh, adolescent driven. It is not uh, predatorily driven. The recidivism rates for juveniles across the state of Pennsylvania for juvenile sex offenders is actually under 2%. And that information was relied on quite heavily by the legislature, I'm sorry, by our Pennsylvania Supreme Court in determining that there was simply an unconstitutional fit between the classification and the regulatory scheme that the legislature established. The last point that I would just add is that the court, our Supreme Court also did rely upon and noted the recent array of the United States Supreme Court cases recognizing the developmental differences between children and acknowledged that that scientific information was likewise relevant in terms of how the court viewed this regulatory scheme and in persuading them to find it unconstitutional. Thank you so much, Marcia. That was fantastic. Just very quickly, could you 
place uh, the Pennsylvania situation in national context? Have challenges to similar juvenile regimes been launched elsewhere? Have they succeeded and failed? Um, and what's on the horizon? There are, uh, I think, about uh, between 15 and 20 states that have similarly adopted legislation that is compliant with the federal requirements. There has been successful litigation in Ohio, and perhaps David could talk a little bit about that, uh, where they were also able to establish that portions of their registration requirements were unconstitutional. The Ohio Supreme Court, interestingly, uh, I think also gave a lot of credence to the Eighth Amendment claims, uh, as well as some of the due process claims. I think that there has been uh, less litigation uh, currently in terms of the uh, in terms of juvenile registration. One of the successes that we had here in Pennsylvania that is not readily available in many other jurisdictions is that Pennsylvania recognizes reputation, one's right to reputation is a fundamental right under our Constitution, which allowed us to really enhance our argument about this presumption of reoffending or dangerousness as essentially putting out an untruth, a falsehood out there about ju about juveniles. And I think that that really uh, contributed to the strength of our due process arguments. There are a handful of states that have similar kinds of constitutional provisions, and I think that those are areas where we'll certainly want to be looking for other opportunities to push this work forward. Wonderful. And just to clarify, uh, what, what does this mean for the future? Is this the end of juvenile registration in Pennsylvania? Yes, right now uh, there is no registration in Pennsylvania. The statute was declared unconstitutional. There is, to the best of my knowledge, uh, no movement afoot right now to uh, modify or introduce some other type of registration scheme that doesn't run afoul of the Constitution. So great news certainly for Pennsylvania uh, juveniles who had been ensnared in that regulatory scheme. Wonderful. Let's move to Ohio since uh, you, you brought it up. David, can you give us an overview of litigation-driven reform in Ohio in recent years? Well, sure. Um, and I just want to thank you for the opportunity to be here, too. This is a very exciting panel. Our work uh, in this area began actually in 2005, uh, challenging residency restrictions. And it's really a story about how important it is to have unusual allies supporting uh, work on behalf of marginalized clients. And it's really um, uh, a, a before and after story because when we first started litigating uh, on, on behalf of people uh, affected by these restrictions in 2005, we focused exclusively on legal arguments that we thought were strong. At the, at the time when we did our litigation, there was a case out of Iowa, um, Doe versus Miller, which was the only court, federal court at that time, which had addressed the question of residency restrictions. And that court, the, the court judge found on a number of grounds, including ex post facto uh, grounds, that the Iowa statute, uh, which forbid um, uh, people uh, with sex offenses from living within 2,000 feet of schools and daycares, it found it unconstitutional. So we thought, hey, we've got a great legal argument here. Uh, we focused exclusively on the legal arguments. We put almost no thought, uh, actually no thought, not almost, but no thought into uh, how to, uh, to, to, to build a coalition that could help us persuade the court that our position was the right position. Uh, because as all of us who've litigated these cases know, it is very difficult to win even when you're right. Even when you know you're right on the law, it is hard to win um, on behalf of unpopular people like sex offenders. So we charged into court and we got our butts absolutely kicked, um, absolutely kicked uh, with our first challenge. And basically the court was, uh, uh, in Southern District of Ohio said, look, the farther we keep kids away from uh, from people who committed sex offenses, the better. And even if these laws just protect one child, uh, then great, uh, the law should be um, upheld. So we then had um, a, sort of a forced timeout, if you will, because at that point we were licking our wounds and luckily the lawyers in Iowa uh, who uh, by this time the Eighth Circuit had reversed the district court um, 
in, in, in the Iowa case I mentioned, uh, the lawyers there asked us if we would be willing to uh, author uh, an amicus brief, brief on behalf of the Association for the Treatment of Sexual Abusers, uh, ATSA, which is the leading um, uh, international research group um, composed of folks who want to keep uh, uh, people safe from sexual violence, uh, if we would author a brief uh, on behalf of ATSA. And that was sort of the first time we had really thought about um, who are the allies that could help us make the arguments in a more compelling way to the court, beyond sort of the legal, the legal framework. And based on, on that work, we were able to learn that there were um, victims' rights groups around the country that did not think these laws did very much to protect the community. In fact, that they were counterproductive to safety because, for a number of reasons, including creating a false sense of security, including um, um, making it more difficult for children who had been victimized by family members to come forward because they were afraid that their, uh, their, their, their family member was going to be basically barred from living in, anywhere in the state. There were a number of reasons why these laws were bad. So we were able, based on our work with ATSA, to figure out law enforcement groups, victims' rights groups, um, who who thought and believed very strongly that resident jurisdictions were a bad policy. And so when we framed our next round of litigation, we were um, able to tap in and get amicus support from these unusual allies. And within about a year of the time that we had uh, lost our first case, we won a federal district court case in the Northern District of Ohio, it's Michaeloff versus Walsh, that held that resident jurisdictions uh, um, uh, impose punishment for ex post facto purposes. And then we won uh, a case in the Ohio Supreme Court. Uh, it's a very conservative uh, uh, court that we thought we had no chance in. And that, in that case, the focus was not ex post facto, but whether the statute um, in question uh, was intended to be um, retroactive um, under the state's retroactivity clause. And so what I felt was a clearly intended uh, uh, retroactive statute, and in fact many people said don't make the retroactivity argument in front of the Ohio Supreme Court, you're going to lose. Um, we wound up making it anyway, and the, I think the key to us winning that case um, by six to one vote was that we had amicus support from uh, the Association for the Treatment of Sexual Abusers, from the Jacob Wetterling Foundation, which is all about keeping kids safe from sexual violence, from a number of state um, coalitions against sexual assault, from Iowa prosecutors uh, who had come out against the residence restriction there because of all the unintended consequences. And so I think that was the key to winning a case. In, in fact, I knew we had won the case when we finished the, our argument and the uh, Chief Justice turned to the other side and said, what do you make of that amicus brief that says these laws don't even work? So now our strategy is one of trying to use interest convergence, trying to take um, Professor Derek Bell's idea of how, how you and he obviously focused on how um, it implied, that concept applied in the racial context where, you know, black folks don't benefit, his theory was, black folks don't benefit um, unless it's in the interest of white people uh, that they benefit. Uh, and he used that, he adopt, uh, created that concept to explain Brown versus Board of Education. Well, now we use that idea whenever we litigate cases on behalf of people on the registry or uh, on the other popular clients we represent because those clients aren't going to win unless it's in the interest of the mainstream society for them to prevail. And so our arguments now very much um, uh, are infused with this interest convergence idea and it's worked, it's worked very well so far, particularly in, the, um, uh, in our Ohio uh, residency re restriction litigation. Thank you so much, David. Um, that's fascinating. You're very welcome. Turning to 
Brandon Buskey also litigating residency restrictions with perhaps a, a less rosy picture at this precise moment. Brandon, can you tell us what's going on in Florida? Uh, hi, everyone. And I, I do want to just thank Social Change for putting this event together. And I, in some ways, wish it happened earlier. So I would have loved to have gotten uh, folks like David and, and Wayne's wisdom on challenging these things for, for adults um, before bringing the litigation that we brought in Miami-Dade County. And, and just to give you a little bit of background, I, I think the, the context is important. Um, you know, many of the folks listening in probably recall a few years ago the situation with the uh, Tuttle Bridge in Miami-Dade County where there was an entire population of former offenders uh, who had been pushed to the limits of society by Miami-Dade County's residency restrictions. And not just the, the county's restrictions, but also the fact that the county was allowing all the separate municipalities throughout Miami-Dade County to pass their own mo more onerous restrictions. And so you got things like uh, you can't live next to a bus stop, which essentially cut out most of the habitable land in the county. Um, you know, that, that situation uh, was disbanded, uh, I think around 2005 or 6, um, and I think for the, for the public, uh, the, the issues seem to sort of go away, at least, you know, and, and to my knowledge, you know, I, I just didn't hear about it anymore uh, and, and thought, you know, they had, they had sort of fixed it or sort of backed off with the most onerous of the restrictions. Um, you know, fast forward to uh, about August of 2013, a bunch of news reports come out uh, that in Miami-Dade County, there are there is, excuse me, there is a separate population of individuals uh, no longer under the bridge, but now moved to an area by railroad tracks at the outskirts of Miami-Dade County. And in fact, there are allegations in, in the papers and from folks we, were, we knew on the ground that uh, it was so bad that probation officers, uh, when individuals couldn't find housing, were directing people to go to uh, the railroad tracks. Did some more digging and found out that a, a number of people who were going to these, this area had been evicted from an area, uh, a mobile home park specifically, that had previously been thought to be compliant with the Miami-Dade restriction, which is 2,500 feet from a school, and I'll put quotation marks up there for reasons that would come apparent later, uh, through a bunch of political uh, maneuvering and not-in-my-backyard sentiment, uh, a group of individuals got together and decided they wanted to get rid of the population of former offenders living in this mobile park by uh, changing the classification of a, of a nearby youth emergency shelter. Uh, and the shelter, although it was, you know, on the outskirts, about 2,400 feet from the area, it was separated from the mobile home park by the Miami River. There's no actual way to get there. Uh, they, went, they went ahead with the eviction uh, proceeding anyway, and 54 people were were kicked out. So that was kind of the context that, that we hit this, and, and I think, you know, immediately, you know, we knew the case needed to be about uh, kind of the, the most drastic aspects of this, you know, the, the kind of continuous problem of homelessness that these restrictions have caused in Miami, the arbitrariness of the county's administration, of this ordinance, uh, and, and then I think which what this what these panels have, have talked about and other folks have mentioned, uh, not simply the fact that these residency restrictions don't work, but also the fact that they are actually counterproductive, and and that by making it harder to get a house, making it harder to get a job, making it harder to manage treatment, you're actually creating uh, a public safety risk, and not for the offenses that they're being restricted from, but for other offenses like failing to register and, and other things where folks are basically going underground rather than face additional homelessness or marginalization. Um, the biggest challenge I, I think for us was, or not, not the biggest, but one of the biggest challenges was uh, finding plaintiffs. You know, we, I went out several times to this area, uh, and as you can imagine, for, for all the reasons uh, that seem reasonable. You know, it's it's just very difficult for individuals to join a lawsuit like this when they when they feel so um, uh, attacked, so marginalized by their own government, and so people were very afraid of what would happen if their probation officers uh, found out they were part of a lawsuit. Now, even after we did explained 
uh, dough filing and things like that. Uh, except a couple other challenges, you know, what, you know theories. Uh, there had already been some some pretty bad Eleventh Circuit case law uh, dealing with registration. Uh, there had been some cases in other district courts kicking out ex post facto challenges. Uh, there had been some other cases in the Eleventh Circuit basically saying that uh, as a substantive matter, there are no fundamental rights that apply in this context. And so we were sort of up against the wall in terms of trying to figure out the best direction uh, to take this as, as, a, as a matter of theory. Um, and also, I think, organizationally, uh, the, the ACLU has had, I think, a, a good amount of success in other states like Colorado and, and more recently in Michigan bringing these challenges, but the ACLU of Florida uh, has been engaged in this fight since the Tuttle Bridge incident uh, with, with very negative results. And so there was, I think, uh, a bit of hesitancy to enter a new fray and get similar results. Um, ultimately, we decided to file, uh, alleging, again, a number of, of different challenges on, on vagueness in terms of the uh, definition of what constitutes a school and how the county administers it, uh, ex post facto, uh, arguing that it's essentially a, a punitive measure in its effects on individuals, and then attempting to carve out what we thought might be uh, two plausible substantive due process rights that were fundamental in terms of uh, the right to establish a home and uh, the right to safety, uh, arguing essentially that you know casting people out into uh, the worst parts of the community, uh, preventing them from getting basic shelter, uh, undermine their own ability to to get shelter. Um, and I'll just fast forward because I, I know our time is short here. You know, we filed the case in uh, October of 2014, and uh, just this past Friday, the district court, after uh, a rather abusive oral argument, uh, issued an order, not summarily, but almost summarily dismissing all of our claims, very little analysis, very little acknowledgement of the facts that we pled in the amended complaint, uh, and, and did so with prejudice, uh, saying that there's you know, no amendment that we could make to the pleadings that would that would fix what he saw as as the deficiencies in our in our lawsuit. Uh, so so now we're sort of at a, at a juncture where we have to decide whether to appeal to the 11th Circuit, which uh, many folks might might know is, is, a, is a fairly hostile, potentially fairly hostile environment for these kinds of claims, uh, or uh, simply regroup and you know, either try a different batch of, of plaintiffs in Miami-Dade County and allege uh, sort of different uh, claims that, that might not be foreclosed entirely by the district court's opinion here, uh, try a litigation challenge in state court uh, to this ordinance, or simply go to uh, a different locality that maybe presents a different sort of form of uh, quote-unquote low-hanging fruit that it might give us a better argument under, say, a protected state law uh, constitutional right. Uh, like the right to travel or something like that. Um, you know, those are all things on the table right now that we're trying to assess in the wake of, of this pretty terrible opinion. Thanks so much, Brandon. Um, I, I, a quick follow-up question to you and David. I don't want to linger on this too long because we're going to come back to it later, but can either of you give us a quick sense of the national landscape of challenges to residency restrictions. It was just the last month has been dramatic. There was the decision out of California from the California Supreme Court that was unequivocal, you know, finding residency restrictions pursuant, I think to, you can, you can inform us if it was the California Constitution or the federal Constitution to be wholesale unconstitutional on a rational basis standard. Uh, and in violation of the fundamental right to be free from unreasonable, arbitrary, and oppressive government action, then you have your Miami outcome at the other end of the spectrum, and the Michigan case where the judge took a, a more piecemeal approach but was more sympathetic to the plaintiff's arguments. Is there a national trend? What's the big picture on this front? David, can you answer that? Well, and, and I'm sure Brandon will chime in. Um, my, my sense of it is that overwhelmingly the conversation is starting to change in a positive way. Um, now, obviously, Brandon's result is just, is just heartbreaking. Um, but, um, I, you know, I think that things are moving in a more positive direction. I mean, I was hopeless when I was doing this, this litigation um, 
uh, in 2005, and uh, particularly after the Eighth Circuit's decision in Doe versus Miller, and you know, and and suddenly now we've got a number of, of good decisions around. Uh, Brandon, I don't know if you want to add or say something different. No, I, I would agree with that uh, wholeheartedly, and that was part of the reason why we felt some confidence with this lawsuit. I, I would say, if I could sort of talk about the trend itself, I think the federal courts have, have broken in a very bad direction on this. I think there's something like 14 federal circuit, federal district courts that have ruled against uh, residency restriction challenges or other kinds of challenges. But the state courts, are, I think, are really starting to take these arguments very seriously. And so we've seen courts in Indiana and uh, in Kentucky really take on this notion of, of how exactly do residency restrictions uh, help public safety. Um, and, and, and of course, like California, that say what we were saying, which is essentially that uh, when you look at the impact overall, this undermines public safety. I think we've only really had in recent years two, uh, I want to say two federal district courts um, strike down residency restrictions. I might be wrong about that, but I think in the last like couple, two or three years, uh, we've seen Colorado strike them down uh, as preempted um, under state law. and. Uh, the Michigan, which I, doesn't really get to residency restrictions, but gets to uh, more narrow issues like uh, the vagueness of certain requirements of registration. But the federal courts, have, I think, have, have by and large washed their hands of this issue, and, and maybe the best direction at this point is, uh, as Marsha noted, to try to find states that, that give more uh, robust protections to certain kinds of rights and, and apply that to this context. Right, that's right. I also, I left out the New York, recent New York decision, which... Oh, another helped. terrible one. <laughs> okay. Well, let's move on to Wayne and a, a different avenue for reform of registration and notification laws, and then we'll move back to a moderated discussion. But uh, Wayne is going to tell us about state-created pathways off the registry. Thank you, Sandy, and thanks to uh, the review and other folks involved, involved in sponsoring this event. Um, so I'll talk a little bit today about uh, some research I did recently in an article that's going to be coming out in the Wisconsin Law Review that um, looks at uh, exit from the registries. And um, I think it's fair to say at this point that um, for the foreseeable future, um, sex offender registration and notifications, it's not going to go away. Uh, and there's been you know, the changes that have happened in terms of circumscribing the scope of registrable offenses. We see Romeo and Juliet offenses, for instance, um, but it's a very marginal change. And these successes, you know, while important, in, in a way they kind of distract from the much larger public policy issue, which uh, concerns the hundreds of thousands of individuals who are on the registry uh, who have been convicted of more serious crimes. And so in this uh, article, I look at uh, state laws. Um, regarding um, exit. So, but I discovered that there's a really pretty remarkable continuum from South Carolina where the only way that uh, juveniles or adult adult uh, registrants can get off is if their conviction is reversed or they get a pardon which is based on a finding, a uh, specific finding of not guilty. Um, and several other jurisdictions only provide marginally more opportunity for exit. Uh, for instance, only allowing uh, juveniles uh, or very significantly limiting uh, the, the scope with respect to folks convicted of uh, uh, non-serious offenses. Um, and so uh, the other aspect which is of note is the uh, criteria that are used uh, to uh, evaluate individuals whether to see whether they're worthy of, of exit. And again, here you see considerable variation. You've got um, you know, states saying that the individual poses no uh, risk to public safety. Um, to uh, substantial risk and things of that nature. And, and of course, this, um, this risk quantum is problematic because psychosexual evaluators are, you know, are professional norms that you know, disallow them from essentially making predictions with respect to certainty. And, of course, that's what courts want here. That's what states want. They want, they're very fearful of type 2 errors. Uh, so, um, so it's a pretty limited situation out there. You know, Iowa is on the other end of the continuum, uh, where it has really quite generous um, uh, possibilities for exit from the registries after two years or so. Um, so what I did, and the other part of the paper is just look at the potential constitutional challenges. And um, as you know, those of us who've been in the field for a while uh, know that it's it's really not very um, positive news on that front. 
And also it was interesting, I found the research, where re the issue of lack of opportunity exit really hasn't come up that much. In the 2003 uh, Smith v. Doe case in the Supreme Court, Justice Ginsburg attached uh, considerable weight in the ex post facto analysis to the fact that there was no opportunity for exit. Um, but there really isn't much uh, else out there. Now, of course, uh, the Connecticut Department of Public Safety Supreme Court opinion also decided in 2003. That looked at the issue of um, uh, risk assessment at the time of um, a person was subject to registration, not the post-registration period, which this paper looks at. And I was able to find only uh, three uh, uh, decisions uh, in courts, state courts, that looked at the procedural due process uh, issues uh, that uh, might be implicated by a lack of opportunity for exit or a very, very circumscribed opportunity for exit. And the three courts, um, one out of Tennessee and two out of West Virginia, uh, denied relief. You know, other possibilities might be um, substitute process and equal protection, but again, you uh, you know, litigators are going to bump up against the reluctance of courts to find fundamental rights or any class-based, uh, impermissible class-based bias with respect to uh, sex offenders uh, as, as a population. Um, and I must say, I, mean, I, I think that there is some room to argue for, with respect to procedural due process, um, particularly given uh, the implicit or explicit uh, tiering uh, that goes on uh, in states with respect to individuals and, um, and, and, and again implicitly that there's risk associated with re respect to uh, how long those folks are on registries, uh, the extent to which they're subject to community notification, you know, the periods uh, in which they have to uh, verify their information. So I think it's a, you know, a, f a fair argument that you know, risk should be assessed at some point down the line after a, a period uh, of time. Um, and so, uh, you know, the paper concludes, you know, kind of along the lines of uh, what, what David and, and Trickler were saying that, you know, I think what, what law reformers need to do um, is uh, persuade legislators and policymakers that it's in their interest uh, to uh, see change in this area. And, you know, the registries, you know, they're up around 800,000 right now, and they're going to continue to grow by the year. And the idea of, you know, not winnowing the registries of individuals who pose uh, uh, public safety risk is is not a very sound public policy position to adopt. Um, Potter Stewart once said in, a, in an opinion, he said, "When everything is classified, nothing is classified." And so, uh, you know, that's an argument I think might have some resonance with policymakers. The other reason why exit opportunities should be expanded, I think, um, is that it will prov provide a positive incentive for individuals to be law-abiding and to and to you know discharge responsibilities of registration um, and to continue to be law-abiding. So I think that in terms of um, convincing public policymakers and the public policy at large of why we should increase opportunities for exit, there's some pretty good arguments to be made. But, you know, I must say, this um, of all the public policy experiments, if you will, over the last 20 years, uh, and registration notification is certainly one of them, um, it seems pretty impregnable to... Um, kind of falsification, and I always like to point to the example of J.C. Duggard um, and all the other, you know, in instances in which people have been victimized by people who are compliant with, with, with registration. So um, I think the time, uh, kind of in line with what people were saying earlier with respect to um, residence restriction uh, challenges, you know, the time might be right uh, to, for law reformers to start looking a little more seriously um, at issues with respect to uh, exit. Okay, well, uh, jumping off from that point, uh, you've each spoken about your particular area of expertise and experience. I would now like to ask you to take a more global perspective and answer the question of what aspect of these laws is in most urgent need of reform? Maybe there is no answer, but uh, I'll take a vote. Is it residency restrictions that render people transient and homeless? and make the public less safe? Is it juvenile registration? Is it the lack of any opportunity for individualized risk assessment or exit or something else? And Wayne, we'll just go back to you to start. Well, I mean, it's hard to prioritize there in terms of a, of a wish list, but um, I'll just kind of look at it from the perspective that I just, you know, with respect to exit, I think it's really important. Um, I, I, I think it's uh, the, you know, I think in any criminal justice um, 
effort to have law reform. Empathy is really important. Um, and um, David earlier used the, the kind of the idea of interest analysis. But you know, these folks on the registries are are alien others to the vast majority of Americans, and they have to have some practical, pragmatic reason. You know, we're seeing the right in crime movement right now. Tr you know, trimming back mass incarceration a bit. But that's dollars and cents. You know, that's being driven by fiscal concerns. Uh, registration and community notification, uh, if you will, is social control on the cheap. Uh, it doesn't require all the expense of putting people away, uh, and nor does you know residence restrictions. Correct. So unless uh, law reformers identify some you know tangible, practical reason why a change should occur, it's going to be very difficult uh, for that to happen. And you know, again, I think. Um, obviously, what uh, Marsh is doing and others are doing with respect to juveniles is really important. But boy, that's a really put, tough stone to push up uphill when people have in their mind, you know, the predator, you know, the predator of juveniles, which is you know, obviously inaccurate. What do you think, Marsha? Well, I was going to actually answer your question all of the above, <laughs> um, and I say that because I think that what all of the presentations this afternoon. Can other people hear, Marsha? Has become uh, the disconnect between the value of pushing people to the margins in terms of where they can live, the onerous registration requirements, the inevitability of breaching those requirements and increasing incarceration uh, is really driven by a societal uh, contempt for individuals who are convicted of sex offenses with virtually no understanding or appreciation or realistic assessment of what those risks are and whether or not those risks persist. There's no question, I believe, that we have a more sympathetic uh, group of plaintiffs when we're talking about juveniles. We have good data with respect to juveniles, but while I may be fortunate because that's the field in which I work, uh, it's very clear to me that this whole scheme that has come about as a consequence of very celebrated cases with very tragic consequences has led, uh, I think, the legislatures across the country, has led courts, has led Congress down a path that is absolutely poor public policy and will not promote public safety. With apologies to Brandon and Dave for jumping in here, I want to respond to that and ask, in that case, is might piecemeal reform in some ways be counterproductive? Does it distract from the fundamental problem with the entire paradigm if you the arguments are premised on the notion that your kids are different, does it entrench the idea that adults are the real predators, the real bad guys who should be on registries? We'll go back to you, Marcia. Well, I think it may. Uh, you know, I'm very mindful when we were doing our litigation here and our partners uh, were defenders who also work on behalf of adult clients. Uh, yes, I think we have the better arguments in some respects because there has been a more generous spirit towards children who commit offenses right now and I think the data is very helpful. So I will run with that as far as I can and I'll push that rock up the hill as fast and as well as I can. But I, but I, I believe sincerely that so much about uh, these registration laws with respect to adults as well, when you marginalize individuals, you prevent them from, from participating productively in society. When you set up those obstacles, whether you're a juvenile or an adult, there's no way that you can promote public safety when these individuals can't get jobs, they can't get education, they can't find housing. So this is, this is a fool's errand here. And Brandon, did you have something to add there? Yeah, I just wanted to jump in. I, I think, uh, you know, to maybe sort of echo some of Marsha's points. I, mean, I, I don't want to, and, and Marsha knows this very well as well, but in, even in that sort of the juvenile sentencing context, uh, you know, I don't want people to have this notion that, you know, advocating on behalf of juveniles is easy because in some ways it's, it sort of works against you, right? Because if somebody says, well, if this individual is displaying these problems at such an early age, then we need to clamp down and uh, impose more harsh things early on to to stop the threat. So, so I think the work is critical, and I think it's it's in this context where there has been uh, there have been so many defeats. It's hard to walk away from uh, opportunistic areas, um, and, and I and I, I don't think that. Uh, 
the defeats that we have had are, are due to our emphasis on juveniles. I think that they are uh, a result of, of not having yet a, a full airing of, of many of these arguments that I think we need to make about the lack of individualization, counterproductivity of residency restrictions. Um, and, and I would add and one of the interesting features about our lawsuit that didn't ultimately wind up helping us was we had an organizational plaintiff called the Florida Action Committee, and that's actually um, a very interesting group of individuals uh, looking to reform Florida's laws who are both victims and former offenders. And, and so it's, they've made it their mission to you know, tell, tell their own personal stories, go to Tallahassee and, and push the legislature to reform these laws uh, and tell their stories and, and kind of come out of the shadows and say, you know, this is who I am. I'm trying to, uh, you know, do the right thing, and, and, it's, and it's had some effect. And, and I think there's a, if there's any kind of a movement that I think is encouraging, I think that there are other groups like that emerging around the country who are willing to say, uh, you know, we are not the monsters that you think you are. Now, whether that's going to be effective, I don't know, but I, I think that the piecemeal strategy needs to contemplate a lot of different things on the fire to figure out uh, what makes a dent. That's a great point, and there are. There are a number of new-ish organizations, but among them RSOL, Reform Sex Offender Laws, Women Against Registration, I think is war. Um, I'm sure there are many others I'm not aware of. So this leads to a question I have, which is what is the role of uh, impact litigators like yourselves um, in engaging with and fostering social change? What's the relationship between reform by litigation and bottom-up or grassroots advocacy? David spoke to that a little well, bit. But do you want to add to that now? Well, I my perspective on this is that the role... I mean, I think the role we play as lawyers is important, but in, you know, as I said earlier, the victories that we won here in Ohio, at least with regard to residency restrictions, I think that had less to do with us and more to do with uh, the victims' rights and law enforcement groups that were with us. And so I think we have to be open to the idea that as litigators we may not play the most important part of the, part of the um, strategy. We might in, certain, in some cases, but we may not. And so being, being open to that I think is really important if we really want to advance change. And we've got to figure out how to engage with – uh, groups in the community who can help us get across the finish line. It's not about who takes the most credit for it. It's about devising a strategy that will work. And we've got to put all things on the table in terms of trying to figure that out because it is a big, big rock, a uh, big heavy rock to roll up a hill, and it's going to be for a while. Marcia, do you have thoughts on that? Yeah, what I would add to that is that I think that unlike the mass incarceration movement where the community in some respects isn't, doesn't feel directly involved because those people are locked up and there are economic reasons to promote it. There are job losses that make communities concerned about having prisons shuttered, but it's a little bit over there. I think to David's point, the issue about sex offender registration laws and schemes, particularly when you're dealing with residency requirements, is you're talking about communities that may be directly affected with respect to allowing these individuals to come back into their communities. So unless we are able to I hate to say this kind of change hearts and minds, but educate communities and educate citizenry about who their who their uh, fellow citizens are, whether they pose legitimate risks or, in fact, no risk or very minimal risk. Ways in which we manage that risk, uh, I think we need to address those issues. Litigation is always a powerful tool. I, as someone who does it, and everyone in this seminar is involved in that, um, I wouldn't abandon it. It's often the the one uh, wedge that allows us to open that door to other kinds of reform. But lasting reform, I think, particularly in this area, is going to require a different kind of community engagement and community openness to this population. And Wayne, do you have anything to add on that point? Are you you know this issue and have worked in it for so long? Do you know have there been explicit efforts to integrate communities of sex offenders in litigation efforts? Not to my knowledge. Um, and you know, this is the tension you see it in, in in capital defense, whether it's going to be client oriented or cause oriented. You know, there's a tension with respect to impact litigation. It's often there. 
and and, and I just think folks who are interested in reforming the, the registration notification laws, you know, be mindful of it to some extent. But there's a much broader goal here, which is to, you know, have a real serious critical examination of the laws, um, in the legislative realm. Really, that's where this needs to be. I think really needs to be battled. Um, courts are really supremely important, but you know. Uh, again, I've come away relatively pessimistic with respect to the exit issue with respect to constitutional litigation. But, you know, policymakers, citizens need to be persuaded that, you know, having a million people on the registries um, is not necessarily good public public policy. And, and to swing back very briefly before we close to litigation and a couple of doctrinal questions, the Supreme Court of the United States just issued a decision relating to sex offender registration. Uh, in Grady v. North Carolina, holding that permanent GPS tracking of a sex offender does constitute a search and so is subject to the Fourth Amendment's requirement of reasonableness. How, will that affect litigation strategy? Is there any prospect of any court finding GPS monitoring to be an unreasonable search? And Wayne, I know you have to leave us shortly, so I'll start with you. Uh, well, I'm sure it was a surprise to see the outcome, I guess. but. It, um but the court has been tilting in more kind of more um, defense-oriented ways in, with respect to the Fourth Amendment the last couple of years. I mean, again, I think the reasonableness, you know, is going to be where the action is. I mean, I think it's that was obviously not a total victory, and uh, I, we'll see where it goes. But it's, there's going to be very powerful government arguments that can be brought, again, you know, that this is a reasonable, um, reasonable intrusion on these individuals' lives. Um, but again, we might see a little bit of a little more granularity here with respect to who is subject to it and, and who is not. Um, that may be one area where um, courts might be drawing lines. And last doctrinal question, and we will close this out. To Marsha, the irrebuttable presumption doctrine made kind of a surprise appearance in that Pennsylvania Supreme Court case. Is that a viable doctrinal argument elsewhere, and even in federal context, uh, although it's been in long disuse? What do you think? Well, it, um, I would argue that it remains alive in the federal context. Uh, it has been uh, refined through the federal courts in terms of requiring that there be a, uh, an identifiable property interest that is harmed as a consequence of invoking this irrebuttable presumption. So I think that uh, that's, that raises this issue again, as Brandon talked about and as certainly the Pennsylvania litigation represents, is the importance of looking at state constitutional opportunities where you have state rights that are elevated. I've always thought the right to travel is a very interesting argument to think about with respect to sex offender registration laws. If you can identify spots where you have rights that are elevated, the irrebuttable presumption, it's kind of a quasi-procedural due process, substantive due process due process argument, but we've had several wins uh, prior to bringing the sex offender challenge here uh, in Pennsylvania. There are some other states that have recognized it as well. Uh, so I would I would encourage my colleagues uh, to explore it uh, and to, to see where it might provide some traction here. The thing about thinking about this in punitive terms and thinking about ex post facto challenges is if you can establish its punishment and you can prevail on the ex post facto challenge, of course we don't necessarily win what happens prospectively. And even if we win on establishing that it's punitive and so you win an ex post facto challenge, to knock the law out entirely, we also then have to prove that it's cruel and unusual. We set up burdens and hurdles for ourselves with each of these claims, so my feeling is, in a sense, the more that we can bring to bear, the more opportunities that we make available to our clients as platforms to challenge these statutes, I think the better off we'll be. All right, and because one of our, uh, well, we've come to the end of an hour, so I think we're going to wrap this up. I want to thank our fantastic panelists for joining us. Thank the NYU Review of Law and Social Change once again for hosting this panel series. Um, and thank all of you for watching. These videos will be posted on the website of the NYU Review of Law and Social Change along with eventual written contributions from some of the participants. So spread the word to uh, people interested in the issue. And thank you so much again. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.